Thank you so much, Michael. Whoa. Thank you. So next we have Karen Youngblut, who's the Director of Global Initiatives at the USC University of Southern California Shoah Foundation. Karen? Hi. Um, I was asked, I think about six weeks ago or so, um, to come and speak to you today. And I think the reason for um, coming here was because I was in um, the refugee camps a few times in the last six months. Um, we're part of, I'm part of the UC Shura Foundation. Um, we're part of the University of Southern California and we collected Holocaust uh, survivor testimonies and witnesses um, of the Holocaust and other genocides in the last 20 years. Part of the work we do is to interview survivors um, and witnesses of these atrocities, um, to hear their stories, to listen to them about what they experienced, but also who they are, what their life was before doing and potentially after the event. For us, part of taking testimonies is about education, it's about research, and it's about raising awareness. And it's about giving the voices to the individuals who've experienced um, these atrocities and to bring them to a global audience. We began to do a documentation process um, in several refugee camps in Bangladesh in the last month and a half. Um, as part of the experience was to first understand, um, does it have a role in a place where you have all of a sudden a million people trying to live um, very close quarters, very hard um, living conditions as you can imagine. And I'm actually curious, I'm gonna ask a question. Who has been in refugee camps around Bangladesh or around Cox's Bazar, who's in the audience? Okay, so it's about 10, 10 or so. So then you know what I'm talking about. And um, I'm, I'm actually here not to tell you anything new because um, I've been listening all day and um, I can only confirm and reconfirm of what I've heard starting this morning with Professor Schulze, who was talking about also the, the importance of looking at this and um, coming with the conclusion that this is clearly a genocide. Um, one of the things that struck me at first when we started to um, have conversations and we started in going into the camp, in um, particular Kutapalong, and had uh, conversations with individuals. Uh, recent refugees um, went into a madrasa, started to talk with the imam, and went every day for a week and had the conversations with those who were around this madrasa. They trusted um, us to talk about what they experienced. Um, they wanted to, for us to understand what we're talking about, uh, what they experienced, and um, we were very, we were just listening. We were not there to look for particular stories. We weren't seeking particular events. We wanted to listen and hear what they had to tell. Um, and part of that was to sort of understand from a, the scale the, of what people experienced and um, I mean, who they were. One of the things that became clear, this particular madrasa, for instance, this is not a community that lived together in the last 20, 50 years. Um, these were individuals who now came back together in this refugee camp in this madrasa who came from 10 different villages. Actually, all three townships were represented among the people that we spoke with. And, um, and they, one person started to talk and then somebody else started to talk and then all of a sudden somebody else was, you could notice, were saying like, I wanted to say something because actually I experienced something very similar to what they just talked about but I'm in a village that's totally different township. And it happened very similar in the same time frame. And, um, and so for us, it started to become clear there is, um, there is a, a need and there is an interest in telling stories um, and documenting of what people experienced. And so we went back and we interviewed about 95 individuals. Um, their micro histories, um, because part of what we usually do or have done is life histories really about sort of um, interviews that are about the sort of entire life until the, the time of interview. But um, 
this was really about establishing who they were, establishing for them to also what their life history was, how the villages they lived in, was their grandfather born in that village or their great-grandfather, where did their family come from, what was their life sort of before like, what kinds of experiences did they have, what kind of um, limits or restrictions that they have. So we've heard everything that was brought up today about you couldn't go anywhere unless you had an ID card or you, you had to pay somebody off. Uh, you couldn't have phones, you couldn't have education, you couldn't see a doctor, you couldn't um, go to different places. If you wanted to get married, you needed an ID. In order to get an ID, you have to sign something. In order to do that, you had to pay something. And by the way, if you sign something, what you signed to get your ID actually said that you're a foreign national. So people were asked to sign something that basically said that they're not citizens of Burma or Myanmar, so that they could marry somebody in their village. Um, so there were clear indications of the kinds of things and restrictions that from the experience of having listened and interviewed Holocaust survivors for a number of years, um, worked in Rwanda for many years, Cambodia, working in, with Guatemala in a number of different places in this world, it seemed like I was listening to stories I've heard before, different places, different countries. And so for me, it sort of seemed like, you know, genocide has many different faces and different sides. Um, out of the 95 micro histories, we've interviewed 44 women and 51 uh, men. And I actually wanted to say thank you to Rosie's uh, Sultana, who helped us with the project uh, as well. And we wanted to make sure that we cover also individuals from different townships, from all three different townships. And we have about 20 different, different villages, um, about four or five people from each of the village um, that were interviewed. The interviews are, on, on average, about half an hour long. Um, and we have interviews with individuals or survivors who are in their late 70s to uh, teenagers. As I said, there are about family history and uh, about what recently happened to them and what happened right before August 25th and how they made it to Bangladesh and their journeys. And the common themes of why us? Why are we not part of the 135? That number has been coming around. One of the first things that happened to us, they were showing us a document and said, how come we're not part of the 135 minorities? How, what's, why are we so special? Why are we so different to us that we cannot be accepted as one minority as 135 others in Burma or Myanmar? Um, and why, are not, why don't we have the opportunities that everybody else has um, and those kinds of things? Now, the, the stories mainly are really the stories that are heartbreaking, are um, um, difficult, horrific, etc. But I do want to say one thing that I started um, by analyzing these interviews now and going through it, um, and I think there was a question this morning about, was there anybody who helped somebody? Have you heard stories that because you come from other genocides and hear about Holocaust, etc., rescuers, etc., um, was that also an experience that you've heard now? Or has anybody heard this word? Um, I have now read one testimony where somebody talked about a medical doctor, a doctor coming secretively always to their village and helping them and giving um, medical um, consultancy, et cetera, but it was very secretively and that if they would have found out, they would have been um, persecuted. So I think the more stories we can collect and the more we can document what happened, um, the more I think we're also starting to see the complexity and a little of what might one say, the gray zone of these experiences, different experiences and the individual experiences to kind of get um, a broader picture of what happened. Um, I think what also was very clearly in the sense of some of the systematic persecution um, before even August for many years as many scholars before me and after me will tell you about, um, is that oftentimes leaders and the activists were the first ones to be attacked or gone after. Well, this is something that we've heard before, we've seen before. Um, and then what was happening in August and how people were describing it was something that was clearly systematic, was clearly something planned, was clearly a concerted effort that was done and implemented on a very geographically diverse and broad spectrum. 
So it's not something that it was a reaction to one village to something else, but it was something that happened in many different places very similarly. In some of the testimonies, um, particular women were talking about that they felt like there were teams, teams that had particular um, had roles. One team was coming in to destroy, another team came in to loot, kill livestock, and another team came in to rape. So this concept of sort of this idea of roles and different roles and different teams and groups that had um, different tasks. I've met with one woman who um, survived by pretending to be dead, about um, lying among many bodies. Um, she was shot in both her legs on the upper thighs, which she clearly showed me, and um, was talking about this. She had another little baby with her. And she talked about how she was shot. There's many other women around her. Um, and they were raped. Um, you know, oftentimes women were shot so that they can't run away and uh, were shot in the leg so they can't run away. Um, and then she was able to actually survive because she pretended to be dead and lying among the bodies and she had a lot of blood over her. So um, while they were still going around and shooting others, she, uh, she thought that she survived because they thought she was already dead. She couldn't have been still alive. But she was, she crawled out at night and was able to get rescued, so to speak. So these are stories that um, we're in the midst of documenting and um, bringing together and um, trying to find a way of raising awareness, having the opportunity to speak at conferences like this, which I very much appreciate, um, is part of where, where we're at and, and um, the involvement um, that we are part of these testimonies are also um, potentially um, evidentiary testimonies um, in the future. I know that we've had um, interest in testimonies of, from some of the other genocides and interviews that we have for trials that have been going on you know, years later. And while, yes, maybe in 10, maybe in 10, what am I talking about, 20, 30, 40, maybe. But I would say even then, if survivors are still alive and the generations can say that people are being held accountable, that counts for something. And I, would, I do want to say that. Um, who talked about emotions? <laughs> Somebody talked about emotions and I'm the one who's going to bring it up. <laughs> um, I do get emotional, I'm sorry. Um, no, 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 no. No, it's not good. Just, I'm going to continue being emotional. Um, what I actually want to talk about, uh, the reason why we're doing this for us or for me or for our organization is we have a universal obligation. You speak up and speak out. We have Armenian testimonies, we've learned from Holocaust testimonies, we have testimonies from many different places, and here we are again, talking while things are happening. And if we don't speak up, who does? And there's one more thing I want to say, actually. Um, actually, there's a few things, a couple of things. One is, we talk also a bit about, but, uh, about denial. I mean, even sort of the question, is it genocide or not? I mean, they're running around with bulldozers, getting rid of the evidence. Jesus, I've heard that before, I've seen that before, quite well documented in other places. Um, you know, the, the denial, in a sense, the, the denial machinery that exists to begin with. Um, but there's, um, there's a quote from one of the interviewees, and this is something that we've heard a lot, which is why I think um, documenting it and to listening to the stories and, and um, bringing them to hopefully a larger audience is, is, he was saying to me sort of, if they want to kill us, they will. We still want to take our right to confess this tragedy to the world. So, for us and for me, I feel it's a universal obligation to speak up and I hope we live in a universe of obligations and responsibilities. And um, so whatever we can do to raise the issue, to speak about it, and to bring the stories of what people experience to light, I'm with you. Thank you. <laughs>